Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here today on the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. I'm joined here today by Ravi Callan, the Minister of Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation in Vancouver, uh, beaming in um, with technology is Melanie Mark, the Minister of Tourism, Arts, Culture and Sport. And here with me in Victoria is Minister Adrian Dix, Minister of Health, and Dr. Bonnie Henry, our Provincial Health Officer. And we are ready now to put COVID-19 behind us. Of course, that's how we feel, but there's still a way to go yet. Three weeks ago, we announced the map to getting us back to a place where we could be together. Our plan was based on not just dates, but also on data. And we're moving forward confidently based on the numbers when it's safe to do so. That was what we said three weeks ago, and that's what we're here to announce today. Dr. Bonnie Henry's modeling shows that we're on the right path. Case counts are declining, hospitalizations are stabilizing, and vaccines are climbing at a positive rate. What we need to do now is take the next careful steps forward. Tomorrow, we will begin step two of our restart plan. This means we're gonna be seeing more people that we care about, visiting more places that we want to go and see, and we'll be safely celebrating the major milestones that we've missed over the past 15 months. Step two ends the current travel restrictions in British Columbia. However, we are advising against non-essential travel from out of province. We want that to remain in place as we watch what other provinces across the country do as they start their restart plans as well. Step two means being able to host a birthday party with up to 50 people in your backyard or in a public outdoor space. It means that it will be safe to go to a movie with some friends. Or more importantly, we'll be able to do what we haven't been able to do for the past year, and that is watch our local sports teams in action. And that I'm very much looking forward to. Several fundamental layers of protection will remain in place through step two. You're still going to have to wear a mask in indoor public spaces, and current safety measures and protocols for businesses will remain in place until we move to phase three. Personal gatherings inside your home should still remain small for now and we need to make sure we stick to one household or five people. Now we've come a long way together over the past 15 months. We've had some ups and we've had some downs. There have been some bumps along the way to be sure and many, many people have made extraordinary sacrifices. But I want to be clear, we want to put the pandemic behind us, but we wanna make sure we take those tentative steps in a way that brings everybody along. British Columbians are anxious to put COVID behind us, but there are still people that are anxious about reopening. They're concerned about the impact of too fast a return to normal and how that might affect their family, their business, or their community. We believe we're on the right track. We've been following the data, we've been following the science from the beginning. That's why British Columbia has had such great success. But as we go forward, we need to remember that you need to get vaccinated. We need to remember that we have to follow public health orders until it's safe to put them behind us. And most importantly, when we reduce our social interactions, we reduce case counts. We reduce the transmissibility of COVID-19. We're on track to meet all of our milestones through the restart plan. I know many people are excited about that and I understand those that are anxious, but together we can get to a place where British Columbia can lead the country in economic revival, can continue to be a place where we don't just flick a switch, but we slowly turn the dial back to a normal place for all of us to be as the summer progresses. I know that all of you are anxious to hear from Dr. Henry about the events of the past number of days as we've seen numbers drop, as we've seen uh, the case counts reduced, uh, hospitalizations reduced, and uh, Minister Dix, I'm sure we'll talk about the largest vaccination program in BC history, which is just going gangbusters. I'm very excited about that. British Columbians should be as well. So with that, I'll invite Dr. Henry to the microphone uh, to continue with some of the more detailed aspects of moving to step two. Thank you very much, Premier, and good morning. In May, we outlined a four-step restart plan, our Restart 2.0, and said then a slow and gradual approach will be taken. This remains the case. We have built in a two-week, in this case, window time or lag between stages that allows us to monitor our progress and ensure we're able to confidently move forward safely. Our progress so far, like the entire pandemic, is a shared effort 
a shared effort between public health, between businesses, between every individual here in British Columbia. We can all be proud of what we have achieved over the last few weeks. As I shared late last week, the data shows us that we are in a good position right now. Hospitalizations, outbreaks, clusters, cases in our community are all down. And the minimum threshold that we had set for state step two, 65% of adults 18 and over being immunized has been more than met. We exceed it 75%, which gives us that confidence that we can move forward now. We will continue to monitor through the next incubation period before moving to the next stage. As we said, this step is step one. Um, sorry, is this step is one incubation period of 14 days so that we will be continuing to watch carefully. We will expect to have continued progress moving back where we can get more of our social connections back together. So let me walk through what is changing and what remains the same for step two. I'll go through uh, the orders. As of tomorrow, the order on gatherings and events will be amended to allow for indoor personal gatherings of up uh, sorry, personal gatherings up to 50 people. Sorry, outdoor personal <laughs> gatherings of up to 50 people. These are the people that we know, that we are close to. So we know the risk. We know if they've been immunized. And we know that it's safer outdoors versus indoors. But we will also be increasing the indoor seated gatherings, organized gatherings, up to 50 people as well. This means places like movie theatres, live theatre, banquet halls can now safely reopen with COVID safety plans in place. And we can have events of up to 50 people in restaurants. So this is very similar to what we had in place last summer. Indoor faith gatherings will also be increasing with a minimum of 50 people or for a larger place of worship, 10% of that total capacity, whichever number is greater. This means if your location has a capacity for a thousand people, you could have up to a hundred people now in an indoor worship service. The outdoor number remains the same for organized gatherings, but you no longer have to be seated. So it has more flexibility to have a small wedding outside, for example. This is a transmission, a transition phase from step two to step three. When it comes to sports, as the Premier has mentioned, we now can have spectators at outdoor sports. So you can go watch your child's soccer game or baseball game, as I know many, many families have been looking forward to doing. Indoor sports and high-intensity fitness can now also resume with COVID safety plans in place. In terms of the food and liquor service premises order, it's now amended to allow for liquor service in restaurants, bars and pubs to be extended until 12 a.m. midnight. And as the Premier noted, the Solicitor General has also lifted the non-essential travel ban for travel within the province. And this means we can go visit family or friends across BC and stay for a while and visit in those communities. All other restrictions at events and gatherings in restaurants and workplaces remain in place right now. And we will be working over the next few weeks to transition in those areas as well. But this means indoor personal gatherings in your home remain small, up to five people or one other household. We need to continue with our safety plans in workplaces, for events, organized gatherings, and masks continue to be important and mandatory in indoor public places. Physical distancing and giving others space is also still required. We need to recognize that not everybody is at the same place right now, and we need to respect their ability to stay away from others right now. Staying home and getting tested if you are sick is incredibly important. And while new cases are much lower, we still do have transmission in our communities, and public health will be working with you with every single case to stop transmission as it happens. As well, for workplaces, Public Health is working with WorkSafe BC, and we're going to be transitioning from those COVID safety plans that we've been relying on to providing and guidance, guidance for employers for communicable disease safety plans that you can use to develop site-specific plans as we move away from the need to focus on COVID-19 alone. And these will be ready before we move to the next phase, hopefully on July 1st. 
With our strong safety plans in place and all of us continuing to use our layers of protection, we can now increase our much needed connections a little bit more. This is a shared effort. This means respecting that those around you may not be moving at the same pace as you, that some people in some communities may not yet be ready to receive visitors or to have gatherings. So check before you go, and that's okay. As we continue to open up, we need to be respectful of people and communities with different comfort levels and different risk levels. And we must also be patient with workers and businesses who are working hard to reopen slowly and safely for everyone. With kindness, compassion, diligence, and commitment, we continue to make great strides here in BC. And I am absolutely optimistic about our brighter days ahead. And I want to thank you for all the work that everyone in BC has been doing to get us there. This will be our summer of hope and healing from this pandemic. And we can make the difference in getting there together. And I'd now like to turn it over to Minister Mark. Thank you so much, Dr. Bonnie Henry. I, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm sending greetings from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And it is such a pleasure to be here today for this exciting step forward in our province's restart. Our tourism, arts, and amateur sports sectors were among the hardest hit by the pandemic. The people working in these industries have been profoundly impacted by more than a year of ongoing restrictions and closures. Despite the many hardships, business owners, workers, and volunteers have been unwavering in their commitment to protect each other and our communities. Without question, their sacrifices made a difference and helped us to get to where we are today. To move into step two allows people to travel throughout BC, visit, their, visit a theatre and watch their kids and other athletes pay, play sports. As we approach July 20, June 21st, which is National Indigenous Day and the first day of summer, I encourage all British Columbians to get out and ex explore the best of BC. Whether your summer plans include heading out on a vacation, taking, taking in an outdoor performance, or cheering on your kids at their tournaments, there is so much to see and do in our province. Destination BC has just launched their Be Open to More summer marketing campaign, which has tremendous suggestions on where and how to explore everything BC has to offer. Check out Hello BC to plan your trip today. And their Know Before You Go guide, which helps visitors ensure the communities they visit are ready to welcome them. While it may take time to get back to where we were, our collective efforts to support BC this summer have never been more important. And we are doing everything we can to ensure BC is safe. Many staff at tourism businesses have taken the recently Be Safe program. This Made in BC safety certificate demonstrates that workers in tourism and hospitality businesses have received training in health and safety best practices and are prioritizing the health of their customers and community. Be Safe shows visitors that BC is a safe place to travel and encourages people to experience new adventures and connect with their province in a different way this summer. I know we're all looking forward to getaways, gatherings, and time to recharge. Whether it's watching your kids play sports outside, going to the theater, or traveling to new and exciting destinations across BC, we can finally get out and support each other, people, jobs, and our economy. I want to express, express my appreciation and Niska Tuxiasm to everyone working so hard in the people industries. People, we know that you have made the sacrifices and efforts and it's made a difference. I want to assure business owners and workers that our province will continue to be a destination of choice. Again, whether you plan, whether your plans include relaxing at the spa, taking in a local show, enjoying authentic indigenous cuisine, using a postponed holiday booking or whale watching on our beautiful waters, the best way we can show our love for BC and tourism businesses is to get out and eat, play, shop, stay. Really, the best thing we can do is plan a week-long getaway instead of a weekend. I want to thank the tourism advisory table, the industry engagement table, and 
everyone in the arts and sports sector for all of your advice to help us get to this really important milestone, Tuxiasm, and now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Minister Callon. Thank you, Minister Mark, and uh, good afternoon. I'm Ravi Kalon, Minister uh, for Jobs, Economic Recovery and Innovation, and I'm pleased to be able to join today for this exciting milestone. Uh, just three short weeks ago, we entered step one. Immediately, you could feel the optimism in communities throughout the province. Many tourism operators, restaurant owners, people in the hospitality sector said the restart plan was welcome news. People were able to get together with friends and family, they were able to travel within their region or visit a local park and have a barbecue. The launch of the Restart Plan signaled that we can soon do more of the things we love to do with the people we care about. As we enter step two, we will be able to travel through OBC. We can hold outdoor personal gatherings up to 50 people. Live theater, movie theaters will also be open with the same capacity limits and employees can return to work or hold in-person meetings. These are just a few of the new things that we can do with proper safety plans in place. This is great news for BC businesses, but we still have, we still know that still some businesses are struggling and we'll continue to support them through this economic recovery. We have made half a billion dollars available in direct relief for small businesses and we extended the deadline for the small and medium sized business recovery grant application to July 2nd. We want to ensure that businesses are heard and supported as we move into the next steps of the restart plan. We have been engaging with business community on step two and will continue to do that for step three. Their input has been critical as we work together to gradually reopen the province safely and carefully. Over the last 16 months, we have seen businesses innovate and adapt. They have quickly adjusted their operations multiple times over. This pandemic continues to show us there are lessons to be learned. It has shown us that we need to do more to be economically resilient in times of uncertainty. And it has shown us that we need to do more to continue to help businesses adapt to the changing markets and conditions. This work uh, is something I'm incredibly passionate about and is something that we will be focused on as we build a stronger BC. We are well on our way. We have recovered 99% of our pre-pandemic employment jobs, and our economy is projected to have strong growth as we recover. But together, there is so much more to do. As we begin to venture out more, I encourage you to visit your local businesses. Shop local, buy BC. We have, whether it's lunch with a few friends at your favorite local restaurant, or go to a spin class that you've been waiting for for a while. Every dollar you spend at BC businesses helps our economy recover and supports workers and families. Together, we will build a brighter future with a strong, sustainable economy for everyone. I would now like to invite up Minister Dix to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Callan, uh, Premier, Dr. Henry. Uh, obviously, today is a good day. Uh, three weeks ago, on May the 25th, we said that we were moving to step one and changes were made. And it was required that we follow the data. And what has happened since then? Well, first of all, a lot of people got vaccinated. The ex this extraordinary public health effort that's involved volunteers, communities, other workers and mostly doctors and nurses and health sciences professionals, ambulance paramedics and firefighters and many more who have been involved in this effort. Uh, over 4 million immunizations across British Columbia since the beginning of the campaign. 3.4 million, more than 3.4 million first doses, more than 600,000 second doses. In the past week, the week ending on Saturday, 408,724 doses in a week and again at the end of this week, we will have used the vaccine we have. It's an extraordinary organization, and I am so grateful to everyone involved and to British Columbians who have come and get vaccinated and vaccinated. Secondly, we said that this was going to be a step-by-step -step process, and it is, that we weren't going to make further changes until this week, and we haven't. We've gone step-by-step, -step, 
We've followed the evidence. We've seen the decline in hospitalization, the decline in people in critical care, the decline in case counts, and the increase in levels of vaccination. This needs to continue to be our path. Over the next couple of weeks, that means two things. One, those who have not been vaccinated need to register and get their dose of COVID-19 vaccine. It is critically important that we continue to do so, that we continue to register, and that's 1-833-838-2323 or online at our Get Vaccinated website. It is critical that we continue the momentum. And secondly, that we take a step-by-step -step approach to the easing of restrictions, and that is precisely what Dr. Henry has presented today, that we continue to care for one another, continue to be safe. It is this step-by-step -step approach, prudent, serious, gradual, that will lead to success. And that is what we promised on May the 25th, what we've all done together to achieve in the intervening period, and we must continue to work on now. I want to thank everyone in British Columbia for their involvement in this, because this has truly been a team effort. Today's achievement has been created by each of us and is shared by all of us, and its message is clear. Continuing to work together will bring us all back together and will define the future that remains ours to build. Thank you very much, and I'm honored to introduce the Premier to take questions. Thank you, Adrian, uh, Melanie, uh, Rabbi, and, and Dr. Henry. It is truly a, a very exciting day for all British Columbians. And as uh, Minister Dick said, we all did this together. And we all have to keep on the same track if we're going to get to stage three or step three uh, by Canada Day. And I'm confident that if British Columbians can follow the guidelines, British Columbians register for vaccines, we'll be good to go. But let's take it a step at a time. As Dr. Henry has advised us repeatedly, the incubation period is critically important. And we need to monitor over the next couple of weeks how these new steps are affecting our public health outcomes. And we're going to do that uh, faithfully and diligently. And I believe that's what British Columbians want to see. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. As a reminder to reporters on the phone line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up only. First question today is from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Thank you. Um, Boris Johnson just announced a four-week delay to the lifting of all restrictions in England because of the Delta variant. And we are a little behind the UK in this pandemic. I'm just wondering if you can walk us through how we are going to prepare for uh, that monitoring the, the Delta and what it might do to the reopening here. Uh, thanks, uh, Justine. Uh, I certainly, uh, we're focused on how we will address issues here in British Columbia, and we've been addressing those issues with guidance from Dr. Henry, so I'll ask her to comment on the Delta variant and how that's affecting our, our activity in British Columbia. Thank you. And yes, that is a, obviously a concern. Um, all of the strains of, of the virus that we've seen circulating are ones that are, are ones that we've been following carefully. So there's a couple of things. We, we are going back, as we have been all along, to making sure that we have um, strong resources to continue to follow every single case of people who are infected with uh, COVID-19 here in BC. And we have that. So the testing, tracing, tracking that we've been doing all along is uh, it continues to be an important part of how we can reopen safely. And the second part of it is actually knowing exactly what strains are, are circulating in the community. And to that end, I announced uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, that we have started doing whole genome sequencing on every single case. And we have the capacity now at our lab at the BCCDC to do uh, whole genome sequencing rapidly on every case. And as case numbers come down, that makes it a lot easier for us to do. So we are monitoring really carefully. And we have had some of the Delta variant, um, particularly there is a long-term care home where we've had an outbreak and we've seen it being transmitted in a couple of areas in the province. But the same measures that we take to reduce transmission from any of the strains of the virus work against this variant as well. The other thing that we have going for us is, if, is the fact that we have increased uh, the level of protection from immunization across the board. 
So we are in a little bit of a different place than the UK, for example, where we have very high rates even in young people. So a lot of transmission that they're seeing right now in the UK is in people in their teens and, and 20s and 30s. And we have very high immunization rates in those, uh, in those age groups already, and we need to continue to make those higher, of course. Um, but uh, that puts us in a slightly different um, position in terms of the amount of people who are protected and the age groups are protected. And so we're not yet, um, and obviously we'll continue to watch, but we're not seeing ongoing transmission and uh, taking off of, of that strain versus any other strain right now. Um, but obviously this is something we'll be watching carefully in the data in the next few weeks for sure. Follow up, Justine? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, Dr. Henry, if you can talk about how important it is to have that booster shot in terms of protection from the Delta variant. I know there's sort of this is still emerging, but uh, what we understand uh, around the difference of having that second shot and whether, whether it's more protective. We do know from uh, studies in a small number of people um, that if you're exposed to uh, that variant, that it, it's still a little bit unclear whether it, um, it, it evades the, the, the antibodies we have from vaccine or if it's the fact that it is just much more transmissible. So it, it is hard to know. What we have seen with the vaccine effectiveness studies we've done here in BC and continue to do under the BC CDC is that our, uh, that vaccine is working at preventing all of the strains of virus that we're seeing circulating in British Columbia. So we'll continue to watch that. Uh, as you know, mostly we had the, the alpha and the gamma, so the, the P1 and the B1.17, and uh, the vaccine was uh, effective um, in older people against those variants as well. So that's important to, to know and that we'll continue to watch. And what we've also seen is that globally, w with a number of different studies, it's shown that if you have a slightly longer interval, you're, you get a, a stronger and longer lasting protection. So we don't want to, to reduce that interval too much so that we have longer lasting protection going through next fall. So we are finding that balance, but it is incredibly important, as you mentioned, to get that second dose as soon as your eight weeks is there and we now have uh, more vaccine coming, we'll be able to do that to make sure that people do get uh, fully immunized as soon as we can. Next question is from Les Lane, Times Colonist. Well, thank you. Dr. Henry, the uh, Olympic basketball qualifying tournament, Victoria, starts in late step two, which is no indoor spectators and then runs through the target date for moving to step three, which is limited indoor spectators. Does that mean no spectators for the two late June game days? And can you confirm that there would be limited spectators for the uh, three July games? I, I can't confirm either of those at the moment. We are working with the organizers and uh, our safe restart team um, that has been dealing with sports and via sport um, as looking at the proposal that they have and uh, we'll be making some decisions with them on that in the near future. Les, do you have a follow-up? I, I was wondering about the, just in general terms, the uh, cruise ship situation. I know it's a federal decision about ports, but you'll be consulted on that. Do you have any perspective on whether there will be any cruise ships uh, allowed to dock in Canada this calendar year? Um, I can pass it over to the Premier to talk about that. I can say that I'm part of a, a group that has been uh, working with Transport Canada and with our uh, federal uh, counterparts in the U.S. about uh, the potential about when cruise ships can um, safely um, come back into to BC um, particularly, and uh, we are still working on many of these questions. Yeah, so a part of this is, of course, the guidance that has come out from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control around uh, what it would take to get uh, cruise ships restarted, and they have very strict guidance, um, which includes things like a very high rate of, of vaccination in both uh, staff and visitors on cruise ships. It has to be up to 95%, and that, of course, gives a lot of protection to those environments. 
However, we do know that shared accommodations and and particularly elderly people, which we tend to see older people who take cruises, it can be a risky environment. And we've seen that in uh, long-term care homes, for example. So we're watching the US guidelines, watching what how they're being interpreted and what's happening with the, the cruise industry in the US uh, very carefully, and particularly with our counterparts in Washington state, which is um, obviously the most relevant for us here in BC. Uh, thank you, Dr. Henry. And I, I would just add, Les, that uh, a great deal of work is going on uh, at the uh, staff level uh, with intergovernmental relations in my office. Uh, Minister Fleming, Minister Mark are meeting with the industry to ensure that they have a complete understanding of what's required to restart uh, the sector. Uh, there are a host of issues are at play here. Of course, we're going to be guided by the science, the federal government also will be guided by the science. And having Dr. Henry working with PHOs across the country to inform uh, Dr. Tam and the advice that she gives to the federal government is critical to that, as, the, as Dr. Henry suggested. But there's also a whole host of other work that needs to be done. Ambassador Hillman, the Canadian representative in Ottawa, and I talk regularly. We're scheduled to talk again this week. And on Thursday, uh, the Prime Minister has asked the Premiers to come together to talk about uh, reopening the borders, uh, land, sea and air. And of course, uh, we're very interested in those discussions. We've been working on it uh, uh, quietly because, uh, you know, the, there is anxiety in the community. I, I know that. I feel that. And we want to make sure we're on the right track. Cruise ships are a component part of reopening the borders, uh, a significant one to be sure. And as I said last week, after talking to Senator Murkowski, uh, the law that she brought forward and was passed will sunset when the borders open. Uh, the new initiative by a, another senator from a landlocked state is another issue in U.S. politics. But what we can do here in British Columbia and in Canada is prepare for reopening the industry. I know people want to come to British Columbia. They want to cruise up the coast of our great province, and we're excited about that as well, but only when it's safe to do so. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. I just want to get a sense of what's going to happen with uh, vaccination supply over the next few weeks. Uh, we heard another announcement uh, from Ottawa today that more Moderna is coming than expected. Um, how much can we expect each week over the next three weeks? Uh, do our clinics have enough capacity? And is there any thought being given uh, to potentially uh, using Moderna and Pfizer at pharmacies or allowing doctor's offices to administer it, considering uh, the amount of supply we're getting? Mr. Dix? Uh, thanks, Richard. Well, first of all, um, obviously our capacity, we've been working to the capacity of a vaccine. So as I mentioned, uh, 408,724 doses administered for the seven days ending on Saturday, which is obviously uh, significant. And uh, this week, uh, we are expecting uh, what's become a regular uh, supply of Pfizer over the next two or three days. And we need that because uh, at the end of each Sunday, we're, we're routinely out of it. Over the last two weeks in June, we're expecting over those two weeks, more in the second week and in the first week, about uh, 962,000 doses over the two weeks of Moderna. And our uh, really remarkable team uh, at, uh, uh, who are leading our immunization effort, led by Dr. Baum and Dr. Henry, are looking at that right now and seeing how to best apply the incremental supply of Moderna to the supplies of Pfizer we're receiving now. So I think the planning has gone very well up to now, and we'll have more to say of that as, that, as the dates uh, that the Moderna will arrive come, uh, come uh, to us. But uh, there is more capacity in our system, as you would expect. Uh, we've been working very precisely to the amount of vaccine we receive each week, and obviously the addition of new vaccine means new opportunities for people to get vaccinated. The important thing, though, this week, um, all around BC, in dozens of communities, there are uh, walk-in, pop-up, first-dose clinics. If you haven't had your first dose in communities across BC, I think there's one in Princeton today, but everywhere in BC, there's an opportunity to get vaccinated with your first dose, and there'll be opportunities for that w uh, where you can register and get vaccinated at the clinic. And that is critically important. For, for everyone in BC, though, get registered if you haven't been registered. 
And there will be, of course, the opportunities for first, first dose and second dose vaccination. That's very important to our continued success. And our hope is that we'll continue to do it because everything we do depends on people in British Columbia as we build the capacity out uh, getting vaccinated. So yes, you, we've got uh, incremental capacity we can use. And yes, we're doing the planning now for this new supply of Moderna. Richard, do you have a follow up? I do. Premier Horgan, you mentioned at the beginning that there's still a reluctance uh, from some to come to a reopening. You know, how does the province ensure that there's not tension between those that are, you know, ready to get moving on to the next step and those who don't want to move on? And, and to Dr. Bonnie Henry, to Dr. Henry, I'm just trying to get a sense of when you ease these restrictions, like uh, something like gyms and, and high intensity classes, are all the other policies still in place, like masking? You know, how do, how do those sort of measures work? Well, broadly speaking, how do we deal with anxiety in the community is uh, something I think most of us have been listening to for quite a number of months. We need to be kind, we need to be calm, and we need to ensure that we keep ourselves and those around us safe. Uh, those three uh, directives have served us all very, very well, and that will help us as we move through uh, step two into step three later in the summer. The vast majority of British Columbians are anxious to put COVID-19 behind us, but we've learned a lot over the past 16 months. And one thing that stands out front and center is we cannot predict what this virus will do. We can behave in a way that will reduce transmission and keep people safe. And that's following the orders through step two and respecting that not everyone is at the same pace. Not everybody wants to get back to, uh, uh, to uh, filled arena to watch the Canucks or, uh, or to go to, to a, a massive concert, uh, but a lot of people do. And I think people will walk, uh, vote with their feet, quite frankly. They're gonna go to events that they're comfortable at, and they're not gonna go to events, uh, events that they are not. And those are personal choices. Government can't dictate those, but we can follow the, uh, the sage advice of our PHO and be kind to people and respectful uh, and be calm when uh, others may not be. And most importantly, make sure that we keep each other safe. And I'll ask Dr. Henry to talk about any other issues in that question. Yeah, so we are doing this as we talked about incrementally, which means that we're still relying on our COVID safety plans, the ones that we've had in place and we've modified over time. So uh, things like high intensity fitness, they still have to have reduced numbers, COVID safety plans in place. Same with the events, the organized events. You know, the numbers are, are 50, but that means we go back to having that plan where you make sure you know who's there, that you have uh, the, the right things in place. But we can open up a little bit more. We can get back to where we were when we had more people involved. But uh, all of the same safety plans uh, that are in place in restaurants remain in place for this phase. This is two weeks. This is gradually increasing our connections, our connectivity. And as the Premier says, we need to, to be mindful that not everybody's in the same boat right now. Um, if we have people who in our family who are going through cancer treatments or elderly people who are not yet comfortable, it's okay to say no to going to that family gathering or putting off a little bit longer um, getting together with friends or others. So everybody has to um, step back and take a look at where they are but we need to also uh, continue to follow the rules in those places where we're going to our fitness class for the first time in a while to make sure that we can do it safely and we can gradually get back to full opening, hopefully very soon. Binter Sajjan, CTV. Hi there. Just wondering if you have updated numbers with regards to vaccinations. Uh, I want to ask you a bit more about second doses. Um, I know when we did first doses, we were told this age group is eligible to book. Um, and now we've got people who say they are nine weeks out and still don't have an invitation. So is it roughly going by, by age group? Are people getting invitations based on what uh, their first dose was, with the date? Uh, just wondering if you can shed a, a bit more light on that. And also if you have a general sense of how long it's basically taking from the time you get your invitation to book to actually getting your shot. 
Yeah, so it, <laughs> thanks. And in, in general, yes, it, it's uh, we prioritize people based on age. As you know, we had a shorter interval to start with, and then we extended the interval to up to 16 weeks. And so mo there was a, a large group of people, particularly in long-term care homes, who had already got their second doses before we um, ended up uh, extending the interval. So it really is based on age, um, with the priority going to those who are the longest from receiving their, their second dose. So that does mean that for some people, um, where the, the goal is to get invites out to people by um, week seven in particular, or week eight, so that you can get booked within the next week to two weeks. So for most people right now, it's around uh, uh, week 10, although there's some people, as I mentioned, who, who received their vaccines in March who are waiting a longer period of time. In most parts of the province now, um, we uh, the, the wait is less than a week, um, but in some places uh, where there's been a lot more uh, uh, people anxious to get immunized, uh, the wait can be as long as two weeks. But with the new vaccine that we have coming, hopefully at the end of this week with Moderna, we can augment our clinics and be able to move people up. So the goal is to, to get an invite out to people um, by week six to seven so that they can be immunized around week eight or nine. So that's how we uh, plan to progress by the time uh, we get through the next few weeks. Follow-up, Bender? Yes, I'm just wondering also with regards to indoor gatherings, um, it seems like the focus is on really having them being seated indoor gatherings, but when you have things like bank halls or restaurants that have up to 50 people, how do you ensure that people remain seated? Is it again on the um, establishment to make sure that happens? And is there going to be enforcement um, over the next couple of weeks to make sure that people abide by those rules and they're yeah. not getting up and dancing or gathering, mm -hmm. I guess? So music is starting, but dancing, we're going to wait a, just a little bit longer for the dancing and singing. Um, but yes, it, it is those COVID safety plans. So up to 50 people, but with the same restrictions that we've had in place before. And we were able to do this quite successfully last summer. So I know businesses know how to do this and they'll be moving at their own pace. So keeping small groups of people, no more than six per table, all of those things are still in place now. And uh, yes, we will be inspecting. You know, we have been doing that with uh, our environmental health officers and WorkSafe BC to make sure that it is safe, not just for the people who are there for the event, but for the workers as well. So those are important considerations. Um, this is two weeks. This is to get us back into how do we do this safely? How do we um, build confidence in going back out and being with people in indoor spaces like we have now? So it's not... Um, it's going to be a transition. This is the next step. And then as we move into, uh, into July, hopefully we'll be able to um, take away a lot of those restrictions. Next question is from Graham Wood, Glacier Media. Hi there. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, just further into the future, Ravi, you said you're talking about buying BC and um, with respect to our international trade policy, could we ex anticipate more trade missions to China, steady as she goes, or efforts to diversify from from the country, uh, given the geopolitical tensions? Yeah, thanks for the question. And so uh, Minister uh, George uh, Chow and I are starting to work on a trade diversification strategy. That's one of the things that was in our mandate letter uh, to look at how we can broaden uh, the trade opportunities for BC. Certainly we have additional opportunities now with recent agreements we've signed with the UK uh, uh, and also obviously with the European Union. Uh, and so we've been meeting with our European Union partners. Uh, of course, uh, when we're able to go and, and, and and, uh, and travel will be up to uh, to others to uh, let us know when we can do so. But uh, certainly we're looking to uh, diversify and broaden our trade opportunities uh, in Europe in particular, but uh, also uh, in some parts of Asia as well. Graham, do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, thank you. Great. Next question is from Lisa Houston, News 1130. Hi there, how are everybody doing today? It's exciting to see this. I'm just wondering about what is possible that could make us have to step back again. You're asked about the UK 
And I'm looking with their percentage of vaccinations for first dose is about the same, second is greater. So is there something that could make us hit a wall and have to step back? Well, I'll, I'll start with that before I invite Dr. Henry back, uh, Lisa. And again, we have charted our own course from the beginning, obviously mindful of what's going on in other jurisdictions, learning from those experiences. Uh, but we have been thoughtful and methodical about this plan. Uh, there was a lot of uh, push to uh, have us open earlier than we were ready to do so. Uh, once we laid out the plan for the course of the summer, uh, Minister Callon, Minister Mark met with uh, industry tables, very excited about having a way forward. What I heard more than anything from businesses, from not-for-profits, from regular people was the uncertainty that they felt about their future. And anytime there's uncertainty in someone's life, that causes anxiety and tension. Having a path forward, having a step-by-step -step process to safely get back to where we all want to be was widely regarded as the best way forward. And we're going to continue to take our own counsel, but of course be guided by the things that we see in other jurisdictions. One of the issues that we talked about today was uh, we want to make sure that non-essential travel from other provinces, for example, remains in place. And we're going to continue to monitor that with my colleagues across uh, the country, as will Dr. Henry with public health officers in those jurisdictions. But I'm confident that we're on the right track, provided we uh, follow the advice and the guidance. Uh, we continue to do the things that we have been doing to get to this place. I'm certain that we can carry on to step three and then later to step four as the summer evolves. But Dr. Henry can uh, deep, uh, do a deeper dive on that for you. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think the things we've learned are that there's always things that are unknown. I think, as you called them, uh, the bricks to the head. So we are watching really carefully. And as I said last time, it, you know, this is a, a stepwise progression, and we're letting the data speak for itself. We're working on making sure that uh, our public health teams are able to manage every case. And you know, we think about it. We've We've spoken to over 145,000 people in British Columbia who've had COVID-19. We know a lot about this virus. We don't know everything, but we can look at what's happening. We look at uh, the rates of immunization in different age groups, where we see transmission, the things that we put in place that make a difference for transmission. And so I don't expect We'll, with what we know now, we'll have to go back, but we may need to slow going forward, depending on what happens. And, and this next couple of weeks will be very key for that. And right now, the public health orders are still in place. So all of those things, other than the changes that we've made today, are still in place. And we'll be looking, uh, as we get closer to July, about how we can lift those orders. And that would be the next step, is to actually get out of the orders entirely and just have those guidance that can help us get through this next step. But we'll be watching the data. We're doing whole genome sequencing on every case, as I mentioned. We're, we're actively managing with people every single case and finding out where the transmission happens so that we can keep a lid on things as we move through into this next phase. And the modeling I showed last week it's likely we will see an increase in numbers of people infected with the virus as we start to come together more. And so that's where we have to find that balance about the things we need to do to be together and our own personal risk and our own personal comfort levels. And some people won't be ready to do that for a while because there is still a risk in our communities right now, but we can manage that risk. We can live with this virus and still get back to those things that are so important in our lives. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? Yes, with the vaccinations, Dr. Henry, you mentioned you know that there's uh, benefit for waiting a little longer. I I'm sure you get a bazillion of these. I get a few of the questions from people, especially getting AstraZeneca. Should they wait longer? Should they get it at their 12 weeks? In places like here on the island where the wait for your second Pfizer can be up to a month, should they just go for the AstraZeneca? I think there's just people are feeling like there's a lot of decision making in their own hands and they don't necessarily feel like they're up to the challenge of making the right choice. Yeah, you know, it, it is it is really difficult. I understand that. Um, and the, the wait times will be coming down for, for um, the mRNA vaccines from the mass clinics. So that will help a little bit. Um, 
but yes, it is reasonable to wait for 12 weeks for AstraZeneca, particularly if you're in a community where there's low rates of transmission. So it, it is a little bit dependent on where you live and which, uh, which vaccine you can access sooner. Um, so here on the island, as you say, the, the waits in our clinics um, are, tend to be a little bit longer. But those will come down too. The other thing that I'll say for people with Astra, who received AstraZeneca is that we will have more information from the UK by the end of June. So if your 12 weeks isn't up before the end of June, that can be helpful. I can't give you a definitive answer right now about whether it's the same or better to receive an mRNA vaccine after a, a, a first dose of AstraZeneca. I can tell you that it's not worse and that there's what we call uh, non-inferiority, which is kind of a, a funny way of, of saying in the medical terms that uh, they're at least as good as uh, receiving a second dose of AstraZeneca. So if you are, are at least concerned a little bit, you can wait um, or you can just make the choice about whichever vaccine comes up first for you. Our last question today is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Yeah, Dr. Henry, uh, despite 71% of the Yukon population being uh, fully immunized, there continues to be outbreaks uh, as they reopen. Should that be an incentive to review or perhaps increase the target in terms of vaccination rates in BC, especially in light of those more contagious variants? Yeah, so l let me be very clear. Our target vaccination rate is as high as we can possibly go, which is, you know, we'd like to get to 100%. I think that probably is not realistic. Um, but our target immunization rates are at least 85, 90%. We would like to see it even higher. And we've had that in, in certain age groups and in certain communities where we've had very high rates of immunization. So our target has always been to get um, people fully protected as much as we possibly can. What we have for our restart is the minimum level that we need um, from a public health perspective with the modeling, the data, the transmission that we're seeing, the minimum level that gives us the comfort that we can move to the next step. And it's not just the immunization. It is also looking at the data, looking at transmission in our communities, looking at where outbreaks are happening, and making sure that we can manage those so that the virus isn't spreading widely in the community like it has done in the past. And that means the minimum number of people that are protected to enable us to get back to some of these other important things. And part of it is because we recognize the, the what we call the unintended consequences, but the consequences of the measures that we've had to put in place to stop transmission also have health impacts. They have economic impacts. They have impacts on our mental and social and emotional well-being. So we want to make sure that we are doing the best that we can to, to minimize those as we get more and more people protected through immunization. But the goal of the program absolutely is to get everybody in BC who wants a vaccine fully vaccinated as soon as we possibly can. Follow-up, Tanya? Please, and if we could get an answer in French, uh, Minister Dix, for my colleagues, thank you. And maybe the Premier wants to weigh in on this one as well. But, you know, as we see this news conference broadcast across the country, the message many are seeing is that BC is open for travel, despite your discouragement still. Is there a worry that interprovincial travel could spark more aggressive transmission of, of the more contagious variants uh, like the Delta? Uh, and you said we, we will likely see an increase in cases as we open up more by nature. But how much of that do you think will be attributed to visitors from other provinces. You know, I think we, we've always managed our own pandemic here in BC, and it has played out differently in different provinces across the country. So yes, um, right now we want to focus on um, BC for people in BC and uh, be able to, to travel within our province, see the people that we haven't seen, go camping, um, do those uh, things that we've been missing. And I know in the tourism sector, we've talked to Minister Mark and I have had a number of conversations and um, many people are not um, accepting bookings from outside of province until uh, we move into the next step so that we can um, move within British Columbia first. It, um, yes, it, it is likely people have 
always come back and forth here. And it is the, that that is one of the factors that we've considered in terms of the, the minimum level of protection through immunization and the amount of transmission that we're seeing in our communities. So yes, very important for us in public health to monitor people coming back and forth, for people to get tested rapidly, for us to be able to, to uh, know exactly what strains are, are circulating as people are moving more in the province. And we will continue to do that through our public health teams across the province. Oui, juste pour dire en français que je pense qu'on va d'un pas, un autre pas. Aujourd'hui, c'est euh, le, le deuxième étage de nos efforts en Colombie-Britannique et nous restons prudents. On va, on va continuer à agir prudemment. Ce qu'on encourage, c'est des gens de, de voyager uh, ici en Colombie-Britannique, qui habitent en Colombie-Britannique, c'est maintenant la priorité. On a des mesures en place pour des prochaines semaines qui restent en place. Donc je pense que ce qui est important aujourd'hui pour nous en Colombie-Britannique, et c'est ce de, de, un peu de changement dans une continuité d'action qui reste sur la vaccination, premièrement, qui reste sur uh, l'action prudente de chaque personne, dans la province et qui reste sur les conseils et les règles imposées euh, par euh, le Dr. Honey, euh, Bonnie Henry et ses confrères et ses consoeurs. Et je pense que si on continue à faire cela en Colombie-Britannique, nous serons sur le bon chemin, le bon chemin. Et il faut, il faut rester là un pas. Aujourd'hui, c'est un deuxième pas, mais il faut toujours rester prudent. Ça, c'est notre attitude. Ça, c'est notre attitude envers le monde, envers le reste du Canada, et ça va continuer à être le cas. And I'd like to introduce Premier Horgan to close. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, I'll, I'll go back, before I uh, answer Tanya's question, I'll go back to, um, to Lisa's, and my plan is to get my second AstraZeneca shot uh, based on long conversations with uh, Dr. Henry. Uh, that uh, came to the conclusion that we were at when we started those conversations, which is the best second dose for AstraZeneca uh, people like me is the first one offered. Uh, there's overwhelming evidence that uh, either way the outcome's going to be good for the uh, British Columbian. And so that's the course I'm following, and I encourage others, as, as uh, the doctor suggested. Uh, these are personal decisions. You make, make your decisions based on the best information you have, and I have uh, a front row seat to the best advice in the province, and the advice I've been given is uh, the best shot I can get is the first shot that's offered to me. So I offer that to those who are grappling with that personal decision. That's the choice that my spouse and I have made. Um, with respect to uh, how the rest of Canada should view what's happening here in British Columbia, uh, I would, uh, again, uh, looking across the country, we've seen a, a decline in case counts uh, across the piece. Uh, still some concerns in Manitoba. Uh, the, the, Prime, uh, the Premier there, of course, is uh, taking extraordinary steps to address those issues. But in Ontario and Alberta, where we saw extremely high third wave cases, those are dropped significantly. And uh, I think as the summer unfolds, we'll be in a better place as vaccinations pick up in those jurisdictions. Our advice to other Canadians is we're going to welcome you uh, down the road, but not today. If you don't have business in British Columbia, uh, it's our preference that you stay where you are. And uh, we will invite you back at the appropriate time when all British Columbians are prepared to welcome you. We have anxiety. We've talked about that. Uh, people know it. They feel it. You have friends and family members and, and loved ones who are talking to you from across the country about how happy they are with the success we've had in British Columbia, and they don't want to put that at risk any more than we do. So my advice to non-British Columbians, if you don't have business here that's essential uh, to your well-being, then please stay where you are until uh, we get to stage three and we can have a fuller discussion about that. I will be meeting with my colleagues and the Prime Minister on Thursday to talk about borders, uh, international borders to be sure, but we always discuss uh, the issues in our various provinces and I'll be making the same request that I've been making for months to my colleagues. Please appeal to your citizens to stay where they are until we all come out of this uh, stronger than we went into it. That would be my advice and that would be my hope. And with that, um, 
I want to thank my colleagues, uh, Minister Mark, uh, Minister Callan, uh, Minister Dix, and, and Dr. Henry for uh, joining me today as we've announced what can only be very positive news for all British Columbians. Uh, we have been told to stay apart, and now we are coming together, bit by bit, step by step. Uh, it's the right way to go. It's appropriate for all of us to take pride in what we've accomplished collectively. Businesses, communities, individuals, families have made extraordinary sacrifices and there's a little bit more to go before we get back to where we were, but it's just around the corner. We can see it, we can feel it, and come July 1st, I'm hopeful that we will be able to further relieve these restrictions, but we need that incubation period. We need that critical couple of weeks to assess the impact of the steps we're taking today. All the best to everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week and um, we'll see you next time.